So welcome everyone. I'm Mary Woolley. I'm the president and CEO of Research America. And on behalf of my colleagues, um, whom you're gonna hear from soon, um, as well as our partners, we wanna welcome you to the launch of the Public Engagement Training Database and Report. This is something new and unique, and it's just gonna get better and better going forward with all of your contributions. It's great to see so many long-standing advocates of public engagement in science. We know from Research America's commissioned survey research that at very high levels, 75%, in fact, of the public, the adult American public, say it's part of a scientist's job to discuss their research and its impact uh, with both public officials and the members of the public itself. But how many scientists really do that or even know how to do that? We'd argue not very many. So it's no surprise to us that despite the public's strong in expression of interest in science, and I'd say even its expectation, scientists remain largely invisible to the broad public. Only a quarter of Americans can name a living scientist and only a third can name a place, any place, where medical research is conducted. That's really not a very hard question. My state's university, the academic medical center, you know, in the nearest city. Um, nonetheless, these are signs of invisibility, things to overcome. It's distressing to all of us that confidence in whether scientists are working in the public's interest has been slipping especially among some demographic groups. It's time to turn this around. Research America has been working with a number of foundation partners to address these issues by empowering effective engagement between the scientific community and the public. It really is a two-way kind of engagement, bi-directional, as we say. With generous support from the Rita Allen Foundation, our civic engagement micro, micro grant program has just kicked off its sixth year, number six year of funding early career scientists to develop projects in their local communities around issues of common concern. Through this program and through other experiences, we've seen firsthand what skills are needed to work meaningfully with community members and public officials. We've also seen barriers that our micro grantees face incorporating this work into their own scientific training and their interests in public engagement. Um, and we've seen that they too often lack the support of their institution and their advisors. We're more convinced than ever that training must be part of the graduate school curriculum and embraced by everyone concerned. Before we started the landscape project, we knew that public engagement training opportunities existed all around the country, um, including many of the ones that some of you may be running, but there were big gaps in our understanding. Our hope was to create a tool to serve the community of practice and to aid us all in building toward broader acceptance of such training across academia. So now I'm gonna to turn to our longstanding and highly valued partner, Claire Pomeroy, a renowned leader in science and president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. Thank you, Claire. We are grateful for the Lasker Foundation's support for and collaboration on this project. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you for your leadership. It's a delight to be here. The Lasker Foundation is dedicated to improving health by increasing support for medical research. Connecting scientists and the public is critical to achieving this mission. And our foundation is steadfastly committed to facilitating effective interactions between scientists and the public. Embarking on the landscape project in late 2022, we were deeply concerned about the decline in the public's trust of science and of scientists. 
And like Research America, we were certainly aware of the many initiatives to train scientists to be better communicators, to understand public policy, to interface with their local communities. But we weren't sure how common are these opportunities? Where are they taking place? Who is participating? What does the curriculum look like? And importantly, how could we help scientists access these educational offerings, both during their training and throughout their careers? It was clear to us that if we want to promote public engagement training and opportunities across academia, we need to better understand the current state of affairs. We need to provide a resource that those of you who are already undertaking this important work could utilize. So we joined forces with Research America to create the Research America Lasker Civic Science Fellowship. And we were so fortunate to recruit an amazing scientist, Fanuel Muindi. And as you will soon hear from him, he has created an impressive database. It will serve as a wonderful tool for those currently working in the public engagement space and for students and faculty who are interested in getting more training. It also brings to the fore areas that need attention, gaps that could be addressed for, by everyone from university leaders, to policymakers and other stakeholders. But, and this is important, this is just the start. We will be supporting Fonwell and Research America to continue building the landscape database over the next year, like a living document and disseminating its use. So we're asking everyone on this Zoom to join us by sharing your insights and your advice. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Jenny Luray, Senior Vice President of Strategy and Public Engagement at Research America. Jenny. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Mary, for helping to set the stage for today's program. Fanwell will take us through the landscape database and share some of the key takeaways. We've planned a good amount of time for your questions. And then after delving into the database, we'll learn about three initiatives from the people who are running them. How do these practitioners see the training landscape? How might this database help with their work? Following Q&A with our panelists, we'll close with a few words from Mary. Let me introduce Fanwell Mwende, uh, the Research America Lasker Civic Science Fellow. As Claire noted, he has worked over the past year to create and develop the public engagement training, base, training database. When we searched for a fellow to undertake this work, we were impressed by his experience as a scientist, a university administrator, and a civic science practitioner in his own right. Born in Tanzania, Fanwell earned his PhD in biology from Stanford and completed his postdoc in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science at MIT. He served as an assistant director of the PhD program in molecular and cellular, cellular biology at Harvard, and he founded the nonprofit SAI Resident Collective, which supports early stage entrepreneurs in civic science. So you'll soon see the information he's collected and curated over the past year, as well as the incredible care he's taken to create an easy to use platform and as Fanwell would readily admit, he didn't work in isolation. He spoke at conferences and workshops and connected with many of you who are joining us today to create this resource. So Fanwell, over to you. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to work on this project uh, for the past year um, and big thanks to the Lasker Foundation and Research America for giving me a shot. Um, so let me take you through uh, the landscape. Um, let me see if I put this on full screen here. Uh, okay. Okay. So so yeah, I will take a, several minutes here just to tell you and and showcase this this uh, dashboard that we've created 
to try to visualize the landscape of training initiatives um, in public engagement. And before I get going, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanted to just get rid of, get, take care of some definitions here that by public engagement, uh, as, as Mary alluded to earlier, we're talking about these intentional and meaningful interactions that provide opportunities for mutual learning between scientists and the members of the public. And this is a quote from the AAAS, uh, their working definition of public engagement. Uh, and there are various um, modalities there through science communications, public policy, and other um, pathways. And then by training, we mean organized activities that focus on developing competency, enhancing exposure, building knowledge base, and fostering professional development. And as um, both Mary and, um, uh, and Jenny alluded to earlier, there's so many of these initiatives that are taking place. And so coming in, myself being someone who's been practicing, um, I wanted to give myself to learn more about what was going on. And so the, the picture really coming in was to, can we characterize the underlying ecosystem of training and public engagement uh, with science? And so the visual that I kind of had in my mind, um, I knew there were dots. They were kind of dotted around like this here on, on this uh, slide. But what I really wanted to get to was a kind of a more high resolution image, if you will, to try to see the, the nuances and the connections in, in there and how these programs, where they are, how are they structured. Because having started my own program as well, um, the SAI Fellows Program, this was something that I always wondered about, like how am I connected to these other initiatives and how can I connect those who are going through my program to those other training opportunities so they can continue on their learning journey. So this coming into this fellowship, I was just pumped and excited uh, to, to try to contribute something that could be useful for the ecosystem. And what I mean by the ecosystem, I and mean, this is just a quick snapshot, and this is what essentially what you're faced with, that there's a lot of things that are happening in different modalities, right? And everybody's going about it in different ways. Uh, with my background in neuroscience, all I can think about were the connections. What are these connections? What are the dots? Okay, and how are they changing, right? Because this is a static picture, and I'll keep referring to this uh, uh, continuously. It's a static picture, but it, there's a lot of dynamic things that are happening. And so I was driven to try to figure out how do we showcase this organism as it's changing? Because a lot there, there's a lot of change that's taking place. And as you'll hear, from our panelists uh, later on. And so that image I showed you earlier, so there are all these components within this landscape, right? From who are the participants, as you heard earlier, what is the impact, uh, the field, logistics, the content, what are they learning about? And the idea is that to, to showcase this map that we're building so we can at least know where things are and how are they changing. And perhaps maybe I can travel there and go there and, and, and talk to or engage with that person that is doing that kind of uh, work. And so hopefully that sets the stage a little bit in terms of how we're thinking about this um, visualization. And so our approach was kind of to go and look at how out there on the field right now, how these initiatives are living, kind of like just going and observing them in the wild. So tapping on my biology background. And so I'm an organismal biologist. That was kind of the best thing. You sit there and observe and watch them as they are living and, and, and executing their functions. So we compiled this from publicly available information, categorized them both qualitatively and quantitatively, and then we visualized them as well. So these kind of this pathway here took a while um, finding them. And, and I want to say huge thanks to a lot of people that contributed to this, as Jenny mentioned earlier. But again, I want to bring back to the guiding framework. Um, we did focus on organizations uh, versus individuals, and this is something we can talk more about in the Q&A as well. Um, and right now, just to get going, uh, the focus is in the United States. And as you may well know, there are a lot that there's also a lot that's going on outside the United States. But for this uh, scope here, we're thinking about the U.S. here. And also a large focus of our um our interest was on the uh, not the on the health literacy programs. So there's a lot of medical communication uh, initiatives that are there. For this current iteration, we don't have those yet. Um, but that field in itself is a very unique um, uh, element that definitely deserves mapping as well. And we'll consider that uh, in the next iterations as well. And so the search strategy um, using various 
keywords and terms. There's lots that's going on going on out there, whether it's science communication, public engagement, science policy, and and this you and I'll highlight later that the terminology be, being used by initiatives is all over the place, and and they're using everything. Um, uh, to try to characterize what is it that they're doing, which makes the job definitely very, very hard. Um, and uh, if I put on my participant hat, that's something that participants have to grapple with as they are trying to figure out where are these things and or where are they happening. And so we use publicly available databases, uh, search engines, um, worked with organizations such, such as the NSPN, whom we contacted their leaders to try to unearth initiatives that um, uh, that are existing that may be not in the public domain and also publish papers. Uh, there's tons of stuff in there, by the way, fun fact. Um, and then conversations with individuals just like this in these meetings who then will tell me, hey, 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 there's something that we're doing here, check it out. And so they'll send me a link and we'll explore. Uh, so it was definitely multi-pronged and um, a lot of people helped along the way and, and I'll have a slide about just thanking those people towards the end. And we characterize initiatives across multiple dimensions. As I mentioned earlier, organismal biologists. So I'm thinking this is an organism. I wanna see all the internal you know, organelles and what's going on, okay? So we map them across the dimensions, whether it's the content, location, funding, uh, which organization are hosting them, um, the cost, leadership, you name it. And so, the challenge though was how do you make this information accessible in a way that can be actionable for diverse stakeholders? And for me, uh, I'm very big on visualizing things. The question was how do we make it visually accessible as well? And that's really the idea for the dashboard came uh, to the forefront. And this was something that I pitched to Jenny very, very much earlier on and said, oh, we should create something like this that, that can sort of create insight as quickly as possible as information comes in and being inspired by the COVID-19 dashboard um, as well, that, that just you know, sealed the deal for me in terms of trying to build something uh, to this nature. So I wanna show you um, this thing in action, okay? So I hope this video plays. Uh, next set of slides here. So we're calling it the TISPI dashboard. Um, it is a single page um, uh, that exists. So here is the full page that you'll be able, if you were to visit, you'll be able to see. And the cool thing about it is everything is connected, okay? It provides multiple entry points for users, whether you're used to the traditional filters that you wanna play with from the top here, or you wanna use just an open-ended search bar that is there uh, to search. Each bar is responsive. And so this is a really nice way to play around with information. You can click on any part of the figure, and then you can look at everything else updates accordingly to that interest that you have. So um, key fundamental uh, function of the database there. You wanna combine different segments from different graphs, you can do that so that you can look at different elements. You can also export some of the summary data for each individual figure, depending on uh, what is being visualized. And you can also go directly to the websites of the initiatives if you want. We also have integrated uh, stakeholder insights directly on there so you can hear from them directly as they are talking. You can also add initiatives. Um, uh, so this is the, the next phase of the program where we want to now unearth even more from those uh, that are interacting with the database who may say, hey, we actually have three new things that we just launched last week. And this is something that I realized, and, and this figure here just shows you this, that we're continuously unearthing new ones uh, literally every month, every month and finding others. And that's why now we're at the critical phase where we want to continue mapping, and I'm really thankful to the Alaska Foundation for, for helping to continue that effort in the next year to, to just make it better um, and so forth. So this video and, and the, the, on the dashboard, there is a how-to video that provides users um, sort of a guide, and they can pause and sort of figure out how uh, different functionality work. And then the report also has even more detail. We have a guide, a whole section of the dashboard guide that takes a potential user or someone who wants to use it, just more details about each of the figures and, and the functionality uh, behind it. I'm happy to tell you more in the Q&A on sort of how we created it um, and the back end of it, um, but because that I created that. So happy to tell you more about that.
So I want to share some of the insights here because the Q&A and later on we'll get into the conversations with the panelists. Uh, we have about like 330 plus uh, unique initiatives and um, a lot of them are clustered around science communication. So there's a figure there that's dedicated to the type of initiative, whether it's science, uh, science policy, science communication, and other different types. So there's a nice visual for that. A lot of them are universities. So 200 plus organizations uh, re representing about half of them from universities. So the, there's a lot that's taking place within those mapped universities. Um, but I will mention that the universities we found are only a fraction of the 3,000 that are available. So there, I think there's a lot of room, again, for discovery and also um, figuring out what these other places are doing or not doing, perhaps around this space. Um, and there are various nonprofits, societies, governments, and for profits. So we have a visual that allows a user to click into each of those segments and explore the information in that modality. And we'll continue enhancing this, right? Because even the nonprofits, they come in various different shapes and sizes. You have in, you know, uh, individual research institutes, for example, and we hope we will be able to characterize those even further and, and provide a way for those who are interested in that category to look at those specifically. Uh, a lot of courses, and I wanna mention here that in just looking at course curriculums in, in universities, you can find courses in the English department, you can find courses in the, the College of Engineering and courses in the Communication Studies department. It's quite impressive where they all are based, uh, how integrated they are, it's unclear, and uh, whether there's communication unknown, um, but you will find them in various different modalities, even within, within one single university. Fellowships are very popular, workshops, certificates, and in the, in the dashboard, we have even more characterizations of various other modalities, um, such as internships. There are uh, programs that we can kind of class, class, classify, degrees, um, both match, uh, masters and bachelors. And so you can play around, and the cool thing about the dashboard is that you can play around and look at how these distributions change against universities, against uh, nonprofits uh, and different organizations. So you can get even more nuanced uh, in your analysis. Uh, a lot of them are accessible online and so 41% hybrid or virtual. And I think even this is very dynamic as we're coming out of the pandemic and uh, new initiatives are coming online, you would see a lot of them having both virtual aspects and in-person aspects if you, Mess around with fellowships, for example. Uh, you see a lot of them are in person in the science policy domain. Uh, duration was an interesting one that you can play with as well. A lot of them are in the short end, zero to three months. And then you have another cluster uh, around the 12 to 18. And you're probably guessing what is happening in 12 to 18. The fellowships tend to be in, around that one uh, year long period of time, very popular length of time for fellowships. And so I want to show you what that actually looks like so we can break it down here. The zero to three, in fact, you can go even further and see that there is this very short, you know, zero or even for a week or two, and you've seen these the workshops and so forth that can be a day to three days uh, long. And then that's the cluster there. And then another one at three months, which is the courses at universities and then fellowships, as I mentioned earlier there. So we'll continue mapping this to see how it shapes up. Um, and then participants, uh, a lot of them are open. so. And I'll I'll go in, into depth about this, but they're targeting multiple. There's faculty, postdocs, uh, graduate students, and even undergrads. They tend to be open, and they will say this on their on their websites. And I want to show you kind of what that looks like because um, the terminology being used for participants is very very diverse. And so here are just two examples of programs using um, descriptions. So the top one here: researchers from all career stages are welcome to apply. However, graduate students must certify that they have advanced to PhD candidacy at the time of application. So that, that little second piece here, advanced to candidacy, you will see that determination and breakdown in some programs. And they do it in various different ways, whether PhD, you need a PhD, and then you need to be no more than two years after your PhD, um, or early career, early career scientist is another popular term. At times it is described, at times it's not. Um, and so it makes it definitely challenging um, when you're trying to figure out, okay, who is this for? And 
Um, but just something to keep in mind uh, that was very notable uh, in the in in my search. And so we try to still come up with some clusters that can help kind of wrangle this because there are just so many terms to try to parse. So in the report, we do break it down. I encourage you once the report is out, please do check the, those out. So we kind of settled on the idea that there are programs that are just accessible except across multiple people. So over three, we just put them under one big category, multiple. <laughs> and then you see these breakdown where only graduate students, only undergraduates, um, or only those with PhD and above or professional degrees. And then these other breakdowns like graduate students and those with PhDs, uh, undergrad and grad, other, it, it, it's actually quite impressive to see the breakdowns and so forth. So you can look at it this way in the dashboard. And another way you can look at on panel B here, so on this heat map, is then to say, well, let's look at these programs, um, these these uh, the, these sort of these participants against the different types of uh, initiatives, right? Whether it's a degree, whether it's an internship, and how they are shaped. And very quickly, you can see, for example, kind of a sanity check that fellowships tend to be very popular again for those with PhD, PhDs uh, and above. Uh, workshops tend to be accessible to all, short term, and they'll do, and that kind of makes sense. Uh, a lot of courses are open to various different uh, groups, uh, and uh, given the um, lot of courses in the undergraduate domain, you see a lot of students as well being targeted there. So this is another way to look at this. So on the dashboard, you can begin to do these multi-layer um, uh, assessments where you combine different segments of the database, whether it's how long it is, from what organization, to get really nuanced. And then as you do this, the, 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 the figures update so that you get a really quick picture about what's going on. So then you can make assessments, okay, what more do I need to know? And which are those programs can I talk to and so forth. So additional insights, a lot of training program. This, um, this was really interesting. Do not provide impact metrics online. You know, and, in, and if they do, testimonials are the main thing that you see uh, being posted on their websites. Um, other things include alumni listings, alumni projects, uh, impact statements are a um, really cool thing that I found um, the where a program would just summarize the information uh, in terms of their impact uh, from past participants. Maybe it's a pre and post uh, summarizing what the, uh, uh, the participants have learned against the objective that they set out. Um, and then there are, of course, some peer reviewed publications um, that do exist. And at times you will find them on program websites. Um, and I believe that Krista and, and both and Daniel as well have those from their program, so they can talk about those uh, in the Q in the, in the discussion section. Um, outside formal university credit is a small number of training websites that that provide these badges. So you get badges, completion certificates. Um, there are continuing education credits, a few that do provide that. I found that quite quite interesting. Plugging into the whole continuing medical education credits. So. Uh, the question there could become, how do we continue to incentivize those who are doing this training to continue doing the training? Because it's not a once and done approach, right? You, the the skill set is continuously changing and people need to continue to update their skill set. So how do we provide a framework for that to take place as well? So something to think about uh, in greater detail uh, on that too. So the report that... Um, that uh, Anthony Dudo um, recently published in 2020 is an interesting one that I encourage you to take out because they discuss a lot of the challenges around um, training programs and evaluation in particular uh, as well. So one of the areas that I really wanted to get into um, also was looking at training initiatives across their content, like what are they actually training their participants to do? So there were two publications that came out in 2019 and 2022, one by Elise Arbach and their colleagues, and the other with Bruce and uh, Bruce Lewinstein and, uh, and um, Bram Sabari. And in there, they were they tried to kind of break down these key components. And so I took a stab at kind of coming up with these uh, broad categories, and then with the idea of trying to kind of fingerprint the initiatives against them. Um, and so they definitely some overlap here and we'll continue updating and making improvements to these. 
Uh, but the take home point was really, could we provide this fingerprint kind of process so a program could have multiple, can, you know, program X could have uh, these things in blue being covered, program Y can, can have these things being covered, and, and, you know, and a different program can have a different uh, fingerprint that, that it has. And so the idea then, if you were to do this 300 plus times, you can begin to build a map, right, about these key areas that are being covered by these programs. And so this was a qualitative assessment. So we would look at the pro pro program descriptions online and try to make an assessment, okay, they're covering this area. And this is where it would help, for example, the key objectives. Some programs are very clear. They'll have like four bullet points, but you want to teach participant X, Y, and Z. Very, very clear. At times that you have to ascertain by reading the curriculums if available or the descriptions online about what that is, because this is ultimately what the participants see, right? When they're going in and looking around different projects. And so we try to do that and summarize it here all in total. And this is an active map that's still on, in process so on the x-axis, all those categories I mentioned, and then the number of uh, percent of initiatives on the y-axis that have that element uh, and uh, keep in mind that programs can have multiple, can be tagged multiple times for different things, right? And so as suspect, as you can suspect, oral communication is something being covered by a lot of programs. Uh, writing, there are some initiatives that exclusively target writing courses, uh, workshops and so forth. Uh, professional development being used as an umbrella term for uh, networking and all these components. In the dashboard, uh, in the report, sorry, we do break these these things down. So you can read up on the report and you can see how we utilize each of these categories and what, what actually went into each one. Uh, but I wanna just bring up the uh, areas here that are kind of under uh, covered or under um, uh, the not well covered, things like um, evaluation uh, being something that is not really uh, kind of highly uh, covered project management, you would see some programs because uh, that in entails more time uh, investment on them. So that could be um, kind of, is not well, well colored ethics, uh, inclusion. And so you would see a couple of programs that target some of these areas, uh, like an inclusive um, uh, science communication uh, conference that takes place as well that tries to address that particular issue. So this is an, was an attempt to try to map the landscape in this uh, dimension. So on the dashboard, you can then click on each of these areas and look at those programs, combine different uh, areas and look at what programs are covering what uh, as well. And, and you can see how the, how, how the duration changes, how the participants that are being targeted changes as well, in addition to geography. So it's really a lot of components that one can get into. Um, and, and Jenny, I think when we were kind of when I showed this to her, she spent uh, several hours and I don't know, quite a bit of time just playing around with it and seeing some interesting insights because all of you have different interests, right? And you're coming at this from multiple points of view. And so the hope is that it really is a benefit to a range of stakeholders, right? Whether it's training developers, uh, funders, uh, researchers, and other leaders in the space who are trying to understand the landscape uh, in its, in its uh, nuances about what, what's going on. And, and this is the key point here that it's a springboard, right? For inspiring new discussions, uh, connections and collaborations. And we're gonna give you a taste of that, uh, right? In this Q and A and the panel discussion as well, because that's where really a lot of the landscape work is taking place, where the, the changes are taking place, where we're looking at people and engaging them directly. So in the report, we do discuss some areas of action that we think are, uh, worthwhile to consider for uh, various stakeholders. So for developers, these are program people who are designing these programs and hosting them. Uh, more precision in the objectives. Uh, I think that that will go a long way articulating what that is. It will help towards thinking about project evaluation as well, but also sharing the um, impact. So the impact statements are one approach that we are thinking about. So um, you can protect perhaps the IP involved um, at times, some programs don't feel comfortable sharing the evaluation reports or cannot share those evaluation reports. Um, in the dashboard, um, you can click on, there's a graph that is designated to like 
oh, they have a peer review publication. You can click on that and you can go to the website and find the publication that, uh, that, that, that is there or they have an impact statement. You can click on that and you can see it exactly what it is. Um, but impact statements were a really intriguing concept where, again, it's a summary of um, what the, the learnings were, right, from the previous iterations of the program. What have you been learning? What has changed uh, in terms of um, the, the participants, right? And so we would see some programs where they would summarize the information in a really succinct way. And that was very, very helpful. Uh, and I'm thinking for a participant, that makes a huge difference as well for a funder. Of course, that's probably an entryway for them to say, I want to talk to you and learn more about what, you, what, you know, what you're learning. At the university level, uh, creating and supporting hubs to coordinate uh, trainings and practice. We are seeing things, whether it's courses, workshops happening in various different segments of universities and um, how much collaboration is taking place and integration, that is not clear. Um, but anecdotally, I'm, I think I'm sensing that people are doing their own thing. And I think there's an opportunity there to think about how do we integrate these initiatives together um, and connect, collaborate, right? And so uh, we're seeing some of that happening um, as well. There's centers of public engagement being created. Um, and I think that helps in galvanize the community and also thinking through about how do we support the initiatives, whether it's training or practice as well. So universities have an opportunity there to, to do more of that. And I didn't talk about funders here. I'm happy to, to tell you more about what we discovered with the funding domain, but at the highest level of kind of additional funding opportunities around public engagement with a focus in training. There's a huge, lots of work taking place with practice. Totally makes sense. Um, let's just not forget about training. That training is a career, career component of this. And I think there might be an opportunity there to focus in on that area and, and uh, spur innovation and creativity and all those uh, other things. So the next steps, as you heard from, from, from um, Claire, dashboard growth will continue building this. This is a first step and we hope that it will continue to grow and you can submit new initiatives. You can update information about an existing initiative contribute insights as well. Um, so there's a form there that has all these uh, inputs for, for people to, to do that. And we'll review them on our end first uh, for new initiative, for example. Um, and then engaging training developers as well. So, and you'll see a taste of that right now um, as we'll, we'll chat, chat with uh, three leaders uh, of programs um, and get their sort of live take on what's going on. So I started here and I wanna end on this note that what we are trying to do is, again, continue to enhance the resolution about what the landscape is and create a tool that can help us keep a pulse about what's going on. Um, and more and more, what I've realized is that the landscape is like this. It's actually dynamic. It's updating. It's moving. It's changing. And it is through the engagements. Okay. And, and this is the next part of this Q&A and then the discussion with the panelists where we'll be able to see um, these components moving around and so forth, okay? So uh, I wanna end here with acknowledging Research America, everybody there, Jenny, um, you've been my, my rock and I, I don't know what else to say. Um, you're like my, my third mom uh, who has just been instrumental in my growth and, and I, I, I left Harvard um, to, to come and do this and, and I'm just, I'm happy I made that call. So. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Mary, um, as well, for all your inputs, uh, Sophia, and the rest of the civic science team. Sophia, Emma was an intern that helped me in initially um, canvassing some of this information. Uh, Claire, Alaska Foundation, and the board, thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, NSBN, big thanks to the community there, SIPEP, the civic science fellows, whom I got invited to present and share insights, and they gave me feedback along the way, right? And this is part of that journey still ongoing. Um, and the SS SSEN network, uh, whose monthly meetings have been such a gem for me to attend and learn so much from their community. Um, so at this time, I'll stop and, and engage in conversation, which I'm really excited and look forward to. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the snapshot uh, as well. Jenny, I believe, yeah, we'll have this dashboard, the link released and the report sent out very shortly as well. So you guys can play around with it and, and have fun. So 
I will end my screen so I can see you all because I cannot see you right now. Let's see. So Thank folks you. can raise their hands or they can. I see some folks clapping. Great presentation, Fanwell. But feel free to raise your hand or post your question in the chat or Q&A. Yes, yes. And if you and if I, Erin, Jenny, if I raise a hand, please just <laughs> go ahead and unmute. This is a friendly space here, so feel free to just unmute and ask away. Lots of clapping. Thumbs up. I'll, oh, I'm sorry. I'll jump in. Thanks, Fenwell. I love your work as always. Um, so I, I wanted to know, like, who are, who are the intended users of this database? And secondly, my second question around this is, um, how will you ensure that the information remains up to date? And could you just, um, before you speak, just identify yourself? Thanks. Sure. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeannie Garbarino from Rockefeller University. Yeah, Jeannie, thank you for, for that question. Um, so we, we, as I mentioned in my slide, um, the users are broad, whether it's a student that wants to know what the opportunities are, um, they can go in here and discover them. Uh, for researchers that are studying this space. And in fact, we have one video right now on the dashboard of someone I just talked to, a researcher. And and so they can go in here and again, kind of get a starter about what initiatives are doing what. And so they can use this to discover them. Um, and other training develop training developers uh, who are uh, either hosting something right now, want to start, start something new. This could be a starter place to say, OK, who is focusing on uh, doing storytelling or all these other components? Right. And when, what are they learning? So they can go in here, find them and then reach out to them because the links are there that they can go to uh, and so forth. Your second question is a very, very important one. Um, so at least for the next year, we'll continue to keep this thing updated. So yay. <laughs> yeah. The hope is that we continue to keep it going uh, in the long run. But this is a really hard thing to do. And I will uh, open to ideas here because yeah, it is. it is, does take man and woman power to, to keep these things going. Um, my lab has built a few of these da dashboards, databases, and I can speak from experience. It's really hard to keep them going, <laughs> but I have a, I'm very passionate about this one. This is one of my few ones that I just have so much fun building. And, and most importantly, the connections I've made and the people I'm connecting with, it's just been amazing. So yeah, uh, people want to help along the way. Please let me know how you think we, you can help. So. And well, there's a question um, in the chat from Claire, and then Bruce raised his hand. He raised his actual hand. Okay, uh, so we'll start with Claire. Please describe how a funder. Yeah, so the for funders, you know, they're always curious about, hey, who is doing what, where, and when, right? And where, where are, um, you know, of course, funders have their own interests and in, in guys that so can come in here and figure out where are these things happening? You know, where are these gaps, right? That they, they can maybe perhaps provide more funding for. That visual I showed at the end there in terms of the different areas that people are focusing on could be a way, right? Maybe it could be something, let's say, how do we provide more instruction around evaluation, right? Around public engagement. So a funder can say, okay, we need to pump up that area, right? Uh, provide more programming around that side. So maybe it could spur some some uh, developers to come and design more programs targeting that specific segment. Um, entrepreneurship, I just drop that in there because that's something that I love uh, uh, doing. Uh, that could be another segment that a funder could say, okay, how do we spur that innovation? And I say that because there are a lot of folk now that not just want to learn how to communicate and call it a day, but they want to have that be something they do, you know, professionally as well. Um, and the recent, um, the civic science uh, roadmap that came out recently, uh, I think is another just signal around that space about how do we continue to support these 
these innovators that are coming out, they're scientists, right? They have, they're, they're multidimensional, they're scientists and there are multiple components. How do we support them? So a funder can think about how do we support them specifically? Um, so yeah, but lots of ways. And uh, Bruce, is that Bruce? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> hi everyone, I'm Bruce Lewinstein. I teach science communication at Cornell. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to have seen some an earlier, at least paper ver uh, iteration of this. Uh, Finn Newell's talked to me a number of times. Um, it's great. It looks wonderful. I can't wait to you know try playing with it. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, well, I've got sort of two examples of how I might use it, and I'm just trying to see whether um, they fit with your model, and then I have a, a question. The, so the two examples are, as you mentioned, um, uh, you had 300 institutions, 330 institutions, of which half were universities. So that means there's about 2,800 uh, colleges and universities out there, or maybe 3,800, depending on which number you use, that aren't offering them. So I can imagine that that's a potential, almost a marketing point of view. I mean, I'm not quite sure which direction you would go, but I, I can see that that's a way of identifying potential people to build programs. Um, I'm part of a, a scientific research network, an NSF-funded uh, Science and Technology Center. Uh, it's a collaboration between four or five other institutions. And one of the roles that I'm trying to figure out is how do I get science communication training for everybody across the network? It's 100 people in this network. I can't do it all myself. Um, uh, and I can see, oh, you know, if I've got a big science project, maybe I can tap into this to see who's nearby. So those are just two examples. My question is, and it's what I've asked you before, and I know the answer, but I sort of want to hear where you are with it now. Um, this is US focused. Um, and there have been a bunch of other projects that have been looking, trying to map science communication training programs globally. Um, the EU funded Global Scape project. Um, there's a project within Spain right now, which I, I actually just saw some data yesterday. I'm gonna ask them if I can connect you to it. Um, that you know, that are doing similar or trying to do things, including that struggle of how do I categorize what's being offered and what's not being offered. Um, so I'm I'm just curious about how you're thinking about you know one limiting this to the U.S. and two um, how do you connect and draw on the international work in this area? Yeah, so I can start with the with the last one. Um, yeah, so so far it's just the US. <laughs> just I had to, we have to make a decision, right? Um, mapping the world is great, but ah, you only really have so much time, right? And and so this gave us a way to get started. Um, we can easily we can expand it. Um, so there's like a little map function on there. It's easily we just add a country, and then suddenly they just stop popping up in there. So that is uh, an add-on, a future iteration that is possible, right? Uh, funders perhaps can help there uh, <laughs> to help us continue the mapping um, as well. And then, yeah, for the, so connecting with these other entities that are doing this work, I think for us, this is not to replace, but to add on to the existing toolkit. Okay. I don't think there's be one toolkit that can solve everything and all, and be everything for everyone, um, but an add on, you know, um, there are some, good databases out there. Uh, this one, we are doing it visually speaking, right? Quantitatively, uh, trying at least, right? And the struggle of categorization is a real one. And and the hope is that with input, we'll continue making that better and better and better, right? So we can help people discover these things because they're popping up. Like, it's just impressive about, about the birth rate. It's, um, we, we do have uh, like inactive um, link in, 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 the, in the dashboard is like, a, this initiative is inactive. Right. So you can actually see what has come before and, and died. And do I think we have all of them? No. <laughs> Those that die completely erase their history from the web. So uh, think about that. We've lost so much data there. Right. And we should not be losing that information. We should try and capture it as much as we can. For the other two examples, yeah. Um, I hope that this helps you, Bruce, <laughs> with with your your discovery process. Um, um, my hope is that for universities as well, they can figure out what's going on internally as well. They can say like, "Hey, my God, I didn't know you were doing that." 
yeah, 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 yeah. Let let let's connect or let's let's you know write this NSF ASL grant together, right? To get more money. I don't know, right? So the hope is that it can just be this galvanizing thing that takes place and one additional tool for them to use. And I hope I answered some of your questions. I may have missed yeah. the no great thanks. I appreciate it. I see other people, I'd love to hear what their questions are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Emily, so, Emily yeah. with uh, the Medcap Institute. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi, Fanuel. Good to meet you. I'm Emily. I just started last week <laughs> as a program specialist at Metcalf, newly minted PhD. So this tool is especially helpful to me trying to get exposed to what the landscape even looks like. So thanks so much for your work. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is sort of uh, still asking a bit more detail about how this tool would be updated. Like if we are, you know, for example, able to make accounts where I'm able to edit like the stuff related to Metcalf directly, um, or if it's just like directly sort of bringing people to websites, I appreciated your call to action sort of of like, we should have impact statements on our website. I think that's a very easy way to sort of streamline. But yeah, just wondering how easy it is for us to update um, versus you first question. And then the second one, um, when because I was trying to figure out this map for myself, I thought of geography, like sort of time and space. So I'm curious if there's a way that you're thinking about sort of filtering where we can look at a map and also like for things like conferences, especially if we maybe that's like a way to sort of make things a little less overwhelming to be like what's happening in December, what's due in January, things like that. Those are great questions. Um, so uh, updating right now, um, we have a link there that you can click and people can either send us ideas for new ones, new initiatives um, that maybe that they're not on there. That's great. Um, they want to update something, they just submit it and then we'll review and then do the updating. So we'll be doing the updating. Um, the dream, of course, in the long run is, yeah, if you can do this yourself, great. Um, uh, there's just some technical things there we have to think about. and. And also from our end was once it's stable enough, right? In terms of, you know, these categories and so forth, then you can think about, okay, let's just automate that towards the back end. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, you're thinking like the long-term vision here as well. Like how do you do this in a way that just integrates everything, right? Uh, if you can create a user account, imagine a student creating a user account to then be able to keep track of them. Wonderful, right? Um, just time, capacity, and 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 funding, right, to, to do all of that. So uh, thank you for that. The, there is a geography. We have a map function on the dashboard, so you can actually see all the initiatives like, um, as a function of the map. So you can just click on different states and be able to see what initiative we found in that specific state. Uh, at least they're home-based. A lot of them are virtually based, so we went with, okay, let's just find out where their home base is, and then you can click on that and be able to find them. This the last question about time. I, I I love that because with conferences they come and go, right? That's a, we can't do that here. Um, I will say I have to think more about how to do that. We probably need a full on like website, uh, um, like dedicated to even conferences. I think because conferences are an interesting animal because inside they do so much internally, right? Um, and so that is a question that that you know like ask PCST and a triple AS, right? They're all these pop popping up, uh, NSBN annual symposium. So good question. And thank you for bringing that up as something to continue thinking about as well. We'll take um, one more question um, for Virginia, uh, who is a SciCom <laughs> storyteller. And then nice we'll to see you again. Panel. Nice oh, hi. Yes, it's been a minute. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Virginia Schuette. I'm a freelance science communicator. I'm often hired to come into institutions as a contractor and do training. Um, and then I also run a business uh, that's in service to advanced science communicators. And we do training as well. Um, so Fenwell, I've, I've talked to a couple of people a couple of years back who were interested in doing something like this. And the initiative stopped before it really even started because they ran into issues with feeling like they had to be the quality judge of things, like who gets into the database. And so I, I'm seeing a couple of people grimacing. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about kind of how you decided 
what got in if you ever decided for things to get out um, as an individual who does individual training, you know, are individuals in there? Um, yeah, some of those issues. How are you feeling about that? Yeah, thank so, you. No, so thanks for that. So no individuals, right? So we we focus on, on institutional and organizational efforts, right? So if you are hosting something at an institution, we will go after that thing that was being hosted there. Um, some, as you know, some universities have designated things that they host locally at their place, and then they bring in external people to like run them, right? So there, that that's one aspect. Um, the quality thing, so that's a very good question. So we actually avoided that question entirely, right? To say, oh, you know, you are good, right? Uh, because your impact is a certain threshold so we can include you, absolutely not, right? The question we asked was, okay, what are your impact like how, how are these initiatives communicating their impact? Okay, that is a stepping stone to then say, okay, let's think more about this. How do we help these initiatives communicate their impact? Because that communication I think is critical. If we are gonna showcase value to these to the university leaders, right? Who wanna maybe invest more money in this space. They wanna know what's going on, is it working? So I think those who are hosting these, these initiatives can at the bare minimum do these impact statements Right. Um, you have to tell us all the detail because sometimes they don't want to do that because of IP issues. Totally get it. Totally get it. Um, but tell us the story about how are you thinking about evaluation? What are you learning? And so for us on the dashboard, it's more about how are they communicating? And a lot of them are not. And that's the take home here. And so there's an opportunity there to do that, to do more of that. All right. Cool. Thank you. So now we're gonna to move to our panel. Um, we're gonna hear from three leaders of three different training initiatives. This was very hard to choose who, um, but I think it's a great uh, example of diversity in, in types of program and where the programs are coming from and what they're doing. So uh, we've got Krista Longton, Dan Pomeroy and Rachel McKinley. And I'm going to ask each of them to do a quick intro um, and say a little bit about their program, and then we'll have some discussion. So, Rachel, why don't we start with you? Yes, thank you so much, Jenny. And I'm so excited to be here and to speak a little bit more about my program. Um, so my name is Rachel McKinley. I'm a science policy manager at the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, our advocacy training program is a three month um, externship that we provide as a member service to our member um, base. Um, so we call um, the participants of our program, we call them delegates. Um, and our, the main goal of our program is really to help to engage um, scientists in local and state advocacy. Um, issues and projects. Um, we have over the course of those three months, uh, three uh, specific modules. Um, the first module is to kind of give a little crash course on state and local governments. Um, the second uh, module is to um, give an overview into um, science policy strategies from science communication on to how to effectively um, engage as an advocate. And then lastly, um, basically an advocacy in action. So that's where um, something that's specific to our program is each of our delegates um, have their own independent advocacy projects. And so throughout the, the entire time, um, we're, we're helping them kind of cultivate their ideas, kind of narrow down, because a lot of them have just these wonderful ideas, kind of really narrow it down to a project that's usually doable um, so that they can actually get out there and actually evoke some types of change in their local um, communities. Um, in addition to this advocacy project, we also help them build a lot of their um, science communication writing skills. So we have them write an op-ed and we help them get this op-ed um, published if that's something that they're interested in. And so those are the two major projects that we have um, during this um, externship. Um, we also 
um, invite them to our Hill Day that we have during our spring with our Public Affairs Advisory Committee so they can further practice some of the skills that they've built throughout the program. And um, after completion of the program, our delegates do get a certificate um, of completion. And I'm very happy to share more about the program. Thank you, Rachel, and you certainly will. We're gonna ask you some questions. Um, Krista, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the program you're running. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm so excited to learn more about um, really so many great folks on the call. So um, lots of really wonderful programming happening here. I'm Dr. Krista Longton. Um, my official title with uh, the Indiana with Indiana University is as an assistant dean of faculty affairs and professional development, and um, we've been doing a couple of programs at IU that I think are relevant to this audience. Um, in 2016, uh, we partnered with the Alda Center really early on to get some programs off the ground at IU. And since then, um, we've created a graduate level minor in communicating science, uh, primarily for students in the biomedical sciences and natural sciences. We also run workshops for medical faculty and science faculty more broadly across IUPUI. We have a residency training program um, at Indiana University School of Medicine, specifically focused on public health advocacy. Um, so we get a day with the medical residents. And then we do community engagement initiatives to demystify science and scientists in partnership with our faculty members across the institution. Through the um, training that we've done, I partnered with one of our faculty members, Anatomy, Cell Biology, and Physiology um, in 2019 to um, apply for funding from the um, Association, uh, American Association for Anatomy to create the SciComm Bootcamp, um, which I know uh, Fanon mentioned that he found our, our published article on that. That was a three-day workshop um, in partnership with the Alda Center. We ran it again this year um, in a two-day format, um, some feedback that we got from our first round. And that really focuses on anatomists engaging with the community and science communication initiatives. Um, so it really is designed to kind of give folks a crash course if they don't have these resources at their institution or they're interested in exploring issues, for example, like evolution, that is really um, kind of the core of, of anatomists and their engagement. So happy to share more about those programs. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks, Krista. And Dan, let's hear from you. Great. Uh, thank you uh, as well for uh, inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and talk to everyone and meet some new people uh, and reconnect with some people that I haven't seen in a while. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm Dan. I, uh, for the last three and a half years, have been uh, building and now co-direct the Scientific Citizenship Initiative at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we focus on developing the next generation of STEM leaders through the use of civic science education, uh, recognizing that the major challenges of our time really exist at the intersection of science and society. Um, specifically, we create, uh, refine and export training programs for STEM graduate students uh, that provide the foundational skills needed for socially responsible, ethical and bi-directional community engagement. Um, we do this in two uh, broad categories. One is classroom-based learning. Um, and uh, for all of these, we uh, develop um, very sort of innovative simulation-based uh, training modules where students work interactively uh, to uh, grapple with you know, challenging ethical issues or thinking about how to engage with policymakers, et cetera. Uh, we pair this uh, classroom-based learning uh, with experiential learning. Um, and most recently, we uh, piloted a program called the Civic Science Clinic, uh, which allows students uh, to practice the skills that they learn in the classroom uh, by working directly in service to society over the summer in a three-month part-time fellowship, uh, where they're placed either uh, as policy advisors in the uh, Massachusetts State Legislature or uh, within Boston-based uh, nonprofit community organizations. Um, so for example, we had a student work uh, with uh, a group called uh, Eastie Farm that does community farming in East Boston uh, and uses farming as a way to bring together parts of the community uh, and provide educational opportunities, uh, et cetera. She helped them develop uh, a series of educational modules for K through 12 students on uh, climate issues. But more importantly, uh, at the end, she said, um, that she's taking that learning back to our research and thinking about how she can engage communities 
in the process of developing her work uh, on fusion uh, energy. Um, and so it's been really exciting. Uh, yeah, that's a quick overview. Terrific, thank you. Well, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions and then we'll turn to our participants. Um, so reflecting on the landscape overview that Fanwell has shared, um, I'd like to ask each of you, what aspect of this landscape presents the most pressing challenges? So how do you look at the landscape from your, each of your perches? Um, and then um, how has demand for what you're providing changed? And how have you changed the way that you look at what you're providing within your, your communities? So why don't we start with, uh, start with Rachel? Um, yes. Um, so in terms of the, the landscape and the, and, and the dashboard and the tool, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I, I haven't necessarily, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would necessarily be a downside to it um, or for a, a downside to programs. If anything, I think it would be pretty helpful, um, especially if there are certain elements that maybe our program doesn't hit on that may be of value to our members that we can share. Um, I think it is definitely an asset um, to us, to our program. Um, and in terms of um, the, the, the need that, that we see um, happening, I definitely see that there, especially with our membership, that more people are seeking out science communication and science policy programs. So I definitely think a dashboard like this is just helpful. Um, overall, um, I can say at least with our applicants, we are getting more applicants for our program each year. Um, at our annual meeting, we're having more people come up to us expressing interests of the program. So um, I think, um, especially, I think that uh, maybe a lot of us may have observed um, over the pandemic that it really has energized a lot of scientists to become more involved in civic engagement. And so I think that there's more of a, a, a need and um, really a, 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 a uh, a, a growing space for this right now within the scientific enterprise. <laughs> Thanks, Ra Thanks, Rachel. And, you know, I think the way I framed that question was confusing. So I'm going to narrow it a little bit, which is from your perch as a program leader. Um, and Rachel, you, you'd you answered this. Um, how do you see this landscape uh, database being helpful? So Dan, you want to go next? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I should have uh, written down some notes during the presentation. But I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, uh, I think all existing organizations would be interested to see uh, the funding landscape uh, in the dashboard. Um, I know we all have great ideas for programs and one of the most challenging things is finding the, the funding to build them. So, uh, so that comes to mind, but also obviously developing partnerships, I think uh, it could be really useful and I'm excited to play around with the tool and see uh, what can come out of that. Um, do you want me to address the second question about yes, demand please. for programs? Okay. Yes. Um, so our program really started as a result of student demand at, at Harvard. Uh, students, uh, especially STEM graduate students, are increasingly realizing that uh, they can't just, you know, work in the lab uh, on, you know, problems without engaging community. And, and the fact that, you know, science historically has done that has led to uh, various problems. So that was our initial demand. Uh, but in the process of building this and making the program kind of more well-known, we're starting to get a lot of demand from other universities and academic institutions for helping them think through how they create programs like this. So for example, uh, we worked with the Broad Institute uh, to develop a, a semester long certificate program uh, called the Societally Engaged Scientist Program. Uh, and now we're working uh, with them. We have an NIH funded project on developing anti-racist uh, uh, educational modules for geneticists. We're working with BU on expanding some of our stuff for uh, high school students. And so uh, the demand started uh, with, with our students, but has grown to like institutional demand from others. And you probably will get more requests uh, once the database is out there. So be, mm -hmm, be yeah. prepared, all of you. Um, and Krista, um, why don't we just um, stick with how you've seen um, interest and demand for your program uh, change? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, we started sort of a part, an in, internal partnership um, at Indiana University around um, science communication in 2016 and have really seen um, our demand increase exponentially during that time. So we're offering more courses, we're offering more training opportunities. And just to kind of dip my toe in the water of your first question, I think one of the things that this database, um, you know, I obviously wish I had it a few years ago because one of the things that it offers us who run these kinds of programs is an opportunity to explore other approaches to evaluation and impact of the programs. Um, and I see my colleagues nodding. And so I, I know that this is a challenge. We can certainly measure our own participants and um, their change over time as they've participated in our programs. But even thinking about, for example, and Dan sort of alluded to this is, um, you know, for us as, um, you know, we're the largest medical school in the country specifically supporting the state of Indiana, thinking about how our programs may have impact in the community isn't something really that we've been able to measure yet. And so I see lots of opportunities with a database like this to share um, promising practices and ideas around um, community based evaluation, connecting with the community to find out their needs and create programs that best you know meet the needs of, of the folks around us who support our work. Thank you, Krista. And Speaking of evaluation, you your program had one of the more evolved evaluations um, that we found, um, that Fanwell found. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about it. I know you also published a paper based on that evaluation. Tell us a little bit about your methodology. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Um, we have a couple of programs at IU that we have evaluated using a sort of, sort of similar mechanism to look at theory of change over time. And we use uh, primarily the Kirkpatrick model to do that. Um, it's interesting because one of my good colleagues in communication studies, Karma Byland, she and her colleagues just recently published a paper um, sort of asking some questions about the Kirkpatrick model, um, which I think is, is really exciting because it pushes us to think more deeply about what the long term impact of our work is. But what we did was we um, asked, um, we developed a series of objectives, thanks to John um, Beasley, Anthony Dudo, those folks thinking very clearly about what we wanted to accomplish with the science communication boot camp. And then we uh, surveyed our participants at the beginning of the program, asking them to rate their um, confidence, willingness um, to participate in knowledge about uh, communicating science practices. We asked them to respond again at the end of the three day um, intervention. And then we followed up with them at two additional periods in time to look at the extent to which um, our curriculum was sticky, for lack of a better way of saying it, and um, got really interesting feedback about what were the things they remembered most, um, ways in which they experienced challenges, institutional challenges, as well as climate based challenges in doing this kind of work. Um, I know that it was alluded to earlier, um, some of the institutional challenges, the idea that some universities just don't value this kind of work in the promotion and tenure process. And so I think that that's gonna be a really important part of advocating for this work in the future. Yes, thank you. And that brings me to uh, another question, perhaps for Rachel and, and Dan, um, which is, what do you hear from students in terms of um, any pushback they're getting in participating uh, in your programs or any uh, you know, concerns they have in terms of how this may or may not conflict with the other demands uh, they're facing in their training? Um, I, I, I can go first. Um, so something that we do hear a lot is um, that a lot of our, our delegates may express that they may not have told maybe their advisor that they're participating in our program because they feel as though maybe their advisor wouldn't necessarily be supportive of them participating in the program. They worry that maybe it may um, take away a certain time that they may have in the lab. So um, I, I think there may be some programs that do require um, you just have your 
advisor sign off, but that's not something that we do with our program. And we also try to make our program as flexible as possible. Um, I, I know what it was like as a graduate student, so I, I completely understand. I know what it's like to have busy schedules. So, uh, you know, we, we have certain assignments, you know, we they they have their program, they have their projects, they have certain deadlines, but we do um, work around their schedules because we know we our our delegates range from undergraduate students all the way up to postdocs. So we know that they have busy, busy schedules. So we try and um, meet them around that. But I think um, definitely concerns about um, what the 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 their PIs, uh, I don't, not necessarily the administration, but what their mm -hmm. um, PIs may think. That's the biggest Dan, pushback. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Dan? Yeah, we actually put a lot of uh, thought and effort into addressing this uh, throughout the program as a, as a relatively new organization at Harvard. Obviously, faculty have a lot of influence and we want to make sure that they stay happy. <laughs> um, and so all of our programs, and we recognize that students have really important academic uh, demands. So all of our programs are designed as extracurricular activities. So for example, our courses are, are nano courses. They're basically workshop style. They're two, three hour sessions typically that students can do uh, in the evening outside their classwork. Uh, our fellowship program is part time, which is 20 hours a week. Um, and for that program, we actually uh, have students um, get permission from their PIs to participate in the program. Um, not only that, but we also have students sit down with their PIs at the beginning of the summer and map out a work plan that identifies all of their responsibilities um, and then meet with the PI at the end of the summer to review that um, and ensure that they were able to fulfill all of their uh, academic responsibilities on top of doing the fellowship program. Uh, we've never had a PI prevent a student uh, from participating in our fellowship, and we've never had a PI uh, indicate that the student hasn't hadn't fulfilled their academic responsibilities over the summer. So we're gathering good data that this is something that can be done uh, and that PIs shouldn't be afraid of it um, and that many are not. Um, but it is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Thank you all. Um, we have a few minutes for questions from our participants, for our panelists. Amy, I have a, a, a question um, for the panelists. Do you find a difference in um, how to teach these skills to uh, science graduate students versus professional, you know, like medical students? I can jump in on that one, Claire. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, we do find some differences, um, and I've got another paper about that, actually, about the differences between the biomedical uh, graduate students, the medical students, residents, and faculty. Um, early on, one of the biggest challenges um, was simply, um, I think, creating a clear connection between the training that we were providing and the world of practice. So for some, um, I should mention that for our biomedical PhD students, a one credit hour course in, in um, science communication is required. So we're very lucky about that at IU and my colleagues and I teach that. And in that course in particular, I have some students who um, kind of push back a little bit that, that they would need to do this. And so um, we have started bringing language, for example, from NIH and NSF um, co Dear Colleague letters and those kinds of things that talk very specifically about community engagement um, and bringing science to the public. The other thing that has been helpful um, it depends on how you think about it, but um, Indiana is a particularly politically polarized state. So in some in some scenarios, that actually helps us a little bit um, because we have faculty members who have uh, faced some challenges, whether teaching undergraduate courses, et cetera, and um, really being able to have productive conversations across perspectives is one of the goals we have for our learners. Um, so for us, it's just been about adapting our curriculum to really meet the needs of the learner while at the same time still meeting the educational objectives of the program. Definitely been a process. Um, I think we've learned a lot um, in it. Um, I'm looking at Rob O'Malley is here. Um, we did some work uh, a, a few years ago with the Evangelical Community Church in Bloomington. Um, 
Indiana around climate, uh, around uh, creation care and climate change. And we learned a ton about um, how we can best have our faculty members be prepared for the kinds of interactions that they have in, in the community. So it's been really powerful. Any other questions for our panelists? I see one in the chat from Claire. Uh, on um, um, how do students find their programs and would the dashboard be useful? I have some quick thoughts on that if it's oh, helpful. Please, Dan, go right ahead. Um, so in our case, our programs are, are currently only limited to Harvard students and they find them. We have a very sort of detailed uh, inclusive outreach strategy that we've developed that involves uh, working uh, not just through the typical channels of emailing, uh, you know, these big listservs, but also engaging directly with identity-based student groups to try to make sure we have a very diverse population of students involved in our programs. Um, in terms of the dashboard being useful, one of the things that I'm trying really hard to do is open the civic science clinic to students beyond Harvard, uh, pending uh, a funding proposal uh, being <laughs> approved. Or, um, and I think in that case, the dashboard could be useful, um, but I will put out the sort of word of warning. I was on a, a career um, uh, development uh, organization BU's best program, uh, where they tried to develop an app to advertise career development opportunities in the Boston area. Uh, and they sort of jumped into that without doing any kind of market research on will students use this app? And if so, what is the best way to design it for them? Um, and so I would say two things, like it could be really useful, but one, it's probably a significant project to figure out how you get students engaged. And two, if you do do that, uh, there's this whole extra layer I would highly advise of like trying to really uh, sort of find not just students in the general sense, but students from uh, diverse populations, which takes, I think, another extra uh, layer of effort. Um, so quick thoughts on that. <laughs> Terrific. Well, um, we're seeing lots of curiosity. When are you going to get access to this database and the report? Um, and the answer is possibly later today, but definitely tomorrow. Um, we're just putting some finishing touches on it and it will be sent to all of you and then it will be posted on our, um, on our website. But you will each get, uh, get it emailed to you uh, very shortly. So um, I'm going to turn things over to Mary. I just want to Again, thank Fanwell. I want to thank our panelists and I want to thank all of you because all of you are out there doing this work uh, each and every day, writing about this work, thinking about it. Um, and we really look forward to working with you in the future um, in terms of building this community. And as Mary will uh, note shortly, um, looking for some broader, more policy oriented changes that perhaps we can make. So Mary, I'm going to hand it over to you now to, to close well, things out. Thank you, Jenny. I'm uh, in awe, in awe of everybody involved here, of all the uh, your wonderful panelists, Rachel, Krista, Dan, you taught me so much there. Um, Fanuel, uh, of course, I've been in awe of Fanuel for some time now. Um, Claire, for your wonderful partnership. Jenny, for your leadership. Um, but to everybody for the work you're doing every day in, um, you know, on a new frontier, a new and important frontier of meeting the expectations, interests, demands, that word has been used, of early career scientists in particular, meeting that demand, but also meeting public and policymaker demand. That demand is palpable right now. We're hearing more and more about it. Um, some of the funding was brought up several times um, in this conversation. And, you know, the big kahuna in funding is, of course, federal and also state funding. Uh, when we can get to the point where there's a universal um, in embrace uh, rather than um, reluctance or even fear of public engagement, um, I'm, I'm optimistic that it will be something that is publicly financed too, um, through, for example, training grants at the NIH, the NSF, and otherwise. But we've got to prove the value first. And that's what you all are doing in your various ways and in all the ways that it will be captured and then eventually added to um, on the, in the dashboard. So as Jenny said, you'll have it soon 
We want you to kick the tires, um, take it for a spin and uh, help us make it stronger, better and more and more useful all the, all, you know, as we go forward. We're gonna continue, as you heard, to work on this project with, and thank you, Claire, the support of the Lasker Foundation. We're also on a parallel track, adjacent track, going to be convening a small group of academic and research leaders. Um, and on that project, the Rita Allen Foundation, and we thank them, uh, will help us to discuss what systemic changes need to be made um, in academia so that we can normalize and grow um, public engagement training and the various related activities that we've been hearing about and that all of us, a sort of coalition already of the willing, can expand to uh, become much more universal. And we will be soliciting your input into the broad questions as well as sharpening um, the points that have been made today and will continue to be drawn. Um, and I know that the landscape is gonna help inform this work. So I learned a lot from listening to you all just now, um, really broadened my thinking, enriched it really. So I, I thank you for what you are doing. Don't stop now, keep leading. Some of the most important work starts in just this kind of way. And as you form a community of practice, I'm proud to be part of it. Thank you for that opportunity. And have a great day. And we look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye.